So with the extraordinary panelists we have here, we are in for an absolutely electric hour and 15 minutes of insight, reflection and advice on all things relating to women in the workplace, on what it means to be a Northern woman or someone from an ordinary state school or working class background in arts, media and politics, and what we can do about those incredibly frustrating things like microaggressions, imposter syndrome, and the patriarchal world in which we're all living and operating. How can we rise up and be the very best and most resilient versions of ourselves when the playing field isn't level? How can we support ourselves and other women on the way and make things better for the next generations? Something that's really important to say tonight, because so many of you will be very conscious of it, is that today is the fifth anniversary of the murder of Joe Cox, whose vision was a world in which we have more in common than that which sets us apart. Two things I really have to say at the start of tonight's session. The first thing is a heartfelt thank you to Tracy for attending tonight on what is such a difficult day for anyone who knew Joe personally. Thank you, Tracy, for resourcing the energy, the time and the space for this exchange. Secondly, I think it's really important that we dedicate this session to Jo and to her memory and her inspirational example. And I urge us to remember the solidarity, the allyship that's so crucial for us to foster between women and feminists, however we may self-define when working for a better world and for change. So in that spirit, let's get started. So first things first, we're going to have a poll first to find out how tenacious you, the audience, are feeling at the start of this event. This is just to get a sense of the weather in this room. So how tenacious is everybody feeling? I'll just give you a minute to respond to that. Um, I hope the panelists can see the poll. I don't think we can vote panelists, but we can see the we can see the results as they come in live. And I think, oh, just a few more people to vote. This is very exciting. I've never done a poll before. <laughs> Great idea, Lucy, um, from Pilot, whose idea this was. Fantastic. So I think we've got a sense that we've got a mixed room, actually. I would say that everyone's in a sort of medium space with this, feeling quite or a bit tenacious. Some people are feeling very tenacious though. All power to you, tenacious women. And some people are feeling not tenacious at all. And I really hope that tonight is gonna to change that feeling for you, for you guys, you 7%. So let's see what we can do about that over the next hour or so. So um, by way of... Um, Opening up to the panel, um, I'd just really like now to invite each of the panel to say a quick hello to us um, and just give a quick audio description of yourself for any visually impaired participants and tell us how tenacious and determined are you feeling at the start of this event as well. So Helen Thomas, I'm going to uh, invite you to speak first. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I knew you'd start with me. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Helen Thomas. Uh, I am the head of BBC Radio 2. Uh, and this evening, I'm really hot. I'm talking to you from London. Uh, it feels like Thailand. Um, and I'm kind of wearing a stripy dress, which is not forgiving. Um, is that what you want, Esther? <laughs> yes, and how tenacious are you feeling, Helen Thomas? Oh, uh, I'm going to say I'm feeling, I'm feeling quite tenacious this evening. Very good. Hannah. Hello, how is everybody doing? Um, yeah, I'm Hannah Peel. I'm a composer and musician and a broadcaster as well. Um, I am currently sat in my auntie's box room which in, in London, which is sweltering after just flying in from um, Belfast, which is pretty cold actually. So in the background um, of myself is a studio that I went to visit a couple of weeks ago in Bath called Real World, which is a beautiful big studio um, owned and run by Peter Gabriel and his team there. Uh, and I'm wearing a pink top. 
Thank you. Um, and a big welcome to all our attendees. Thank you so much for making these notes in the chat. So hello, Durham. Hello, York. Hello, Scarborough. Hello, Darlington. Um, hello, Harborn. Hello, Nottingham. Um, hello, Leeds. Thank you so much for coming along. That's a great um, geographical spread of northerners um, that we have assembled. Lisa. Hi everybody, um, I'm Lisa Holsworth. I'm a TV writer predominantly, done a bit of theatre as well, uh, and I am the chair of the, the Writers Guild of Great, Great Britain, so um, I'm the chair of that trade union. I am joining you from my office, which is in the attic of my house, has uh, green walls, uh, green and orange walls, I've just painted that, that wall orange, and directly behind me is a life life-size cardboard cutout of Iron Man, who is wearing a Leeds United scarf, um, <laughs> of course. Fantastic. Sharon. Hello. Um, how lovely it is to be here. And I'm going to say hello to your mum and dad, I think, who are on this session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing them there in the chat. I'm Sharon Watson, and I'm the CEO and the principal of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance, and we're based in the heart of Chapel Town in Leeds. Um, prior to, I was the uh, 11 years as the artistic director of Phoenix Dance Theatre. And I'm sat in my office, which is just relatively newly painted. Um, and I'm wearing a, I think this is a snake skin top, which is also not very forgiving. And it is definitely very, very warm in my room. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just a big hello to Hull. I missed Hull. Um, hello, Hull. And a big hello from Helen. <laughs> Helen, who is from Hull. Um, big thumbs up there from, from Helen. Um, Tracy. Well, how great to be here. And thanks everybody for taking the time out. I'm sat in my office, which is a temporary office in Leeds, facing Channel 4 and um, the Grand Hotel. Uh, it's a brilliant view, actually. I can't believe quite that I'm here. Um, so I've got a big TV screen behind me. It's Pride Month. So I'm committed to equality, inclusion and diversity in all of my 10 manifesto pledges for mayor. Um, I'm going to appoint an inclusivity champion, but you have to lead from the front. So we are having everywhere in our office, we have flags and people have been excited enough to volunteer for an LGBT group we haven't had before. Now we will hopefully have in the combined authority. So there are flags everywhere, pride flags, rainbow flags. I'm wearing um, a rainbow-ish floral dress and my bra is definitely too tight. Um, and in this heat, um, that's pretty unforgiving. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here and looking forward to your questions. And, um, and like Esther said, this is a tough day for so many people in Batley and Spen, where I was the Member of Parliament, um, and I definitely wouldn't be on this journey um, had that horrendous event not happened, but also the encouragement I got from Jo when we were campaigning together. So this is definitely a session in her memory, and if, if only one person on this Zoom goes off to do something they didn't think they were going to do, then definitely it's been worth doing this evening. So thank you for the invitation. That's absolutely fantastic, Tracy. Thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, so um, I think we should get stuck in. Um, so let's do that. One thing I need to say though before we do that is, unfortunately, we've only got Tracy till 8.30 tonight. So if you've got a burning question specifically for Tracy, I would really not be shy about sticking it in the Q&A, just to say that to everybody who's listening in. Um, but I'm going to ask all of you um, a question first, which is really how important is your personal connection to the North and how do you feel it shaped who you are? Um, so, Tracy, would you like to answer that first? Sure. Before, before I became a member of Parliament, I was in the creative industries as a writer and an actor. And to be honest, it, it was everything. And my identity was absolutely about the North. I didn't go to drama school, so I had quite, when I started out, quite a thick accent. So inevitably I played Northerners and I played working class characters. And ironically, I never played a character in 30 years that wore a suit. 
Um, so I never played a solicitor or a lawyer or a mayor or a member of parliament. Um, and, um, you know, I was pleased to be in that niche um, because it meant that when people were casting northerners, at least I was on the list. Um, and uh, then going into Coronation Street and uh, doing uh, telly where I played northerners, then that just creates more northern roles. But that's that was fine. And then when I um, uh, heard that Joe was campaigning in Batley and Spen, where I was born and raised, and meeting her and campaigning with her for the general election and again against library closures, you know, my sense of pride about being from West Yorkshire, um, all, all, most of my writing uh, was set in Yorkshire towns and with Yorkshire characters. Um, I then went over to the other side when I was on Hollyoaks for a few years, um, uh, but I still class that as Northern. Um, and then um, obviously standing to be the mayor of West Yorkshire, I really, you know, it has absolutely been everything about who I am. And I do think that devolution has meant that the public want the advocates who understand them. And if I could just say I was on the, I commute to work on the bus and I was on the, I was going home from work and uh, this guy came up to me and said, oh, you're Tracy Brabin. And he was nearly crying and he said, I, I voted for you. I voted for you because you're one of us. And I think having um, the journey that I've gone on, which is uh, from a council flat, uh, I was, you know, all my life, uh, we had a two bedroom council flat, me, my sister, and mum and dad. And, but, Everything that I am has been defined by that upbringing and I've never lost it. Um, I believe it drives me for opportunity for young people who, you know, I, I had all the opportunities in the world because of a Labour government and I go back to my estate and I don't see those same life chances there um, because of austerity and because of political decisions and I want to change that as the mayor of West Yorkshire I want to and so being from Yorkshire being um proud of where I'm from I think has engaged the public but also is everything about my manifesto of commitments is about opportunity about belief in in us and that it doesn't matter where you're from, how much your parents earn, what you what they do for a living, you know, um, how much money you've got in the bank, you should still be able to flourish um, uh, and uh, have a thick accent and a glorious accent and still get on, get in and get on. So it is absolutely everything I am. And I have lost a bit of my accent because, you know, once you're acting, I have played um, Fergie once and I did try and do a, a posh accent. And I was pretty rubbish. I did sound like Mrs. Slocum on acid or something. You know, it was uh, my the Americans couldn't hear my flat vowels. So I think I got away with it. But um, it is everything that I am and everything that I'm proud of. Oh, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. And thank you for covering such rich, brilliant ground in that answer as well. Um, super stuff, fantastic and super inspirational. Lisa, what, what does it mean to you? Um, much like Tracy, it's it's everything. It's, it informs everything I write, whether I'm writing, uh, I was on Emmerdale for three years and I think often I was the only person with the Yorkshire accent on that writing team. Um, so, you know, that felt very natural. But even when I'm writing about vampires and, and witches, which is what I've been doing for the last year, it, it's all in there. And I think there's an inherent trust um, of Northerners that, Comes, I think people feel at home exactly what Tracy says. People feel, even if they're from Wales, if they're from Scotland, that you're one of them, and and that's been enormously to my advantage. But also, there has been times when people have massively underestimated me because of my accent. I love it when that happens because then I show them who I really am. Fantastic! I love it, and I, I I would like to hear a little bit more about that later. But we'll we'll save that, and I think we'll come back to that, Hannah. Hello. Um, yeah, I've got quite a mixed um, feeling and a, a journey of accents. Uh, I was born in Northern Ireland and then we moved to Yorkshire when I was eight at the end of the 90s and um, was immediately picked on because I had an Irish accent and didn't fit in. And actually me and my brother lost our accents within two weeks. We had full Barnsley accents from then on and it's it stayed. <laughs> so, um, But I guess one of the things that 
my parents were really wanted to, to do with us was to put us into music and the arts because it is a universal language you know we came from a kind of folk background which is very strong in Barnsley in Yorkshire and um, you know I was given free brass lessons I started off on the cornet and then went on to the trombone and most of my musical upbringing was collaborating working with people working in the community doing brass band concerts uh, the school that I went to we were really great with music and we even went to like Ukraine and did a kind of um, a trip with the council to the Ukraine and and so you know it does inform stories I've never felt like I was fully Irish maybe or fully Yorkshire but I've been adopted by both and I think that's a really great thing because it's stuck in my musical palette but I guess one of the things that you know what Tracy was saying it was amazing to have those free brass lessons and free string lessons and we used to go to a place called pads in barnsley that was amazing for dance i think he paid like 50p to do dance lessons and you know you could join every orchestra there was going every night um and that's sadly all gone and i just don't know how any other working class kids can get into music and get given free instruments at the moment i think that's a it's a massive thing that concerns me Mm, absolutely yeah it's um it's horrifying and especially when we sort of set it against the example of the opportunities that we all had as state school kids um it's really really alarming um so thank you for already drawing attention to that and that's another really important theme that i think we need to come back to um helen hello hi <laughs> Well, uh, I am from the Blessed Hull, um, and I lived in Hull for the first 18 years of my life, and I loved it, and I made the most of it uh, when I was there, and I, you know, I was just trying to tot up how long I've been living in London, which is an astonishing, like alarming kind of 23 years that I've been living here. But even now, I still feel completely Northern. It is absolutely central to who I am and the way I look at the world. And, um, you know, working for the BBC, that's so important, you know, that, the, um, you know, from the BBC perspective, that we continue to deliver value to all audiences and we reflect the lives of all our audiences right across the country. And I do feel that it was a privilege to um, grow up in Hull, where I grew up. And in terms of how it shaped who I am, I mean, you know, cut me in half, and it will say, from Hull. Um, to the extent that when Hull was announced as City of Culture 2017, my phone went into absolute meltdown. It's hilarious. I, as I say, I haven't lived there since, you know, since I left to go to university. But because everyone knows me as Helen from Hull, uh, everyone was, uh, you know, absolutely cheering. And it was a great honour for me to sit on the BBC, uh, the pan BBC steering group for Hull City of Culture 2017, um, to, to really kind of ramp up the BBC involvement with the city uh, and the partnership with the city for all the great things, you know, how we could amplify uh, all the great things that were already going on in the city. So, um, yeah. It will never leave me. You can you can take the you can take the girl out of hole, but you'll never take the hole out of the girl. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Wow, those are fascinating stories. Um, I would say that it's um, it's everything about what's helped me to get to where I am today. It really has helped me to print the DNA of my of my culture and the DNA of my art form um, because of where I am and because of where I've grown up because of the communities that's enabled me to live my dream. Um, I, I'm here in Leeds and in the heart of where I, actually it was my stomping ground here in Chapel Town and Hare Halls, and I've come right full circle back here. At the age of 16, I went to London, spent many years in London thinking that that was gonna be it for me. I've made it, I've made it I'm having my career there. And it was, there was a moment that I was called back to Leeds, which I never thought I, I would ever do because 
you know, it was all happening for me. And I just came back and went, I don't think I'm ever leaving these again. I could do everything I need to do from, from this space and from this place. I would say that I'm loved here in, in Leeds and I love Leeds. I'm really valued on a, on a national level and it's because of my northernness. And I'm appreciated all over the world. What's not to love about that in terms of Leeds being the place and a central hub of actually creativity. And I think what I would reiterate again is just that it was a, it enabled me to pave the way for what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve. And there's some northerners that I absolutely thank for their tenacity and their continuity of drive that's really helped kind of put um, the arts that I, I so love on the map. So Leeds is everything for me. And actually what we're able to do is to kind of rub, the, rub those hard boundaries that really don't quite exist because the generosity that we have as northerners always kind of make sure that we are incorporating and embracing what is to the right, to the left, north and south of us. So I think we were, um, we're well placed. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I'm, I'm loving this um, deep love of um, the North that I'm feeling um, through this conversation. Um, and I just want to say a big hello to Sheffield, because um, we've also got Sheffield on this call as well. So um, I'm just feeling the Northern love <laughs> emanating from this call and across our absolutely glorious region. Um, You've already what you've said has stirred up lots of questions for me. Um, and um, that I think the first one I'd quite like to ask it is um, whether you think um, your background um, and your kind of northernness um, has equipped you with a certain spirit or certain qualities that turn out to actually be rocket fuel um, in terms of leadership and making stuff happen. What, what do you feel about that? Sharon's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, I, yeah, I, I would definitely say it, it has impacted. I think there is something about, they kind of tend to say that Northerners are a little shy at coming forward and, and various others, but I think we've got quite a, a sensitivity around these conversations, but also we've got a bravado about us as well that we stand proud of who we are and what we can do. Um, I'm the first generation of, of my family. Um, my family have come from the Caribbean. And I'm one of three that was born here. So compared to my brothers and sisters, we have we have a mixture of cultures. And I think, you know, being able to really embrace that within the schooling that we had, within the work that we delivered, and also just the people that looked after you because you were a local lass. Um, and being able to take that on board and actually help to frame your character. So I, I wouldn't say that we are um, shy babes. I'm sure that's something... Uh, Maybe many of us have been told at times, but I don't believe that's kind of us. But I do feel that we have an integrity and an honesty around how we operate and how we communicate. And I think we like equality as people. There's something very, very strong and powerful about being able to stand and, and kind of call it out and hold your own in terms of how things are communicated. Um, we are grafters. That kind of really does form part of who we are. We are definitely grafters and very incredibly proud of what we were able to offer, not just in our, again, in not in our, just our locality, but in terms of the way in which we talk, I and mean, Tracy, you talked about the kind of, the, the bigger picture of what we have to do in order to make change. Well, Northerners are not going to come, going to be shy about making that happen and actually talking about the inequalities. Um, and as females, that's even an added, another added layer that I think us, us as females, we definitely stand strong, stand tall and say it as it is. Mm, fantastic. I feel so inspired with, by what you've just said, and I completely agree. Um, does anybody else want to come in and add, add to that? It's really hard to add to that because I think Sharon's just covered so brilliantly, um, you know, the equality, the grafting, the commitment, the standing together, the community, the, the, whole, the whole deal. Um, and in a sense, the compassion, the compassion and the care. Um, it's really, really beautiful. Hannah. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that and say that, you know, I guess being from the North, you didn't really get as many opportunities as what a lot of people get from the South. And I even noticed that even today. And you sort of take these kind of things that you can take in order to make something and and do as like what um, Sharon was saying, you know, I think that that strong streak of independence, you kind of get that early um, feeling of like if I don't do this this isn't going to happen so you kind of make it happen and you make sure that you get the people around you to to join in on that and there's a certain way of I always find with 
like a lot of northern women that are, are doing really well is that they've got a way of saying something that makes you want to get involved and makes you want to be part of it and i think that's a really special quality that doesn't come from having give been given lots of stuff i think it's from not knowing saying hey they've got that and i haven't got that and yeah that equality is is really strong mm. wonderful thank you tracy just to add to that i think it is that striver quality but also that that need for fairness but also an honesty. Um, and we know that in the media, they always portray um, Northerners as you know straight talking and honest, but I do feel it is true that being in the House of Parliament, all that shenanigans that some people who've come from a different background might love all the, you know, the political gossip and all of that. Whereas I just felt I want to get things done. And I absolutely pick up on Hannah's point that I think, when you're growing up in, in an area that has had underfunding, you do take those opportunities because you know they're not going to come every five minutes. And I've got two, two daughters who are Londoners who are very relaxed about opportunities for that come again because they live in London. I, I live up here, they live down there, and they're very used to those chances. Whereas I, I've always felt if a door is open, I think Lisa's heard me say this before, if a door is open, you walk through it because the thing you regret is the thing you don't do. And I think when you have limited opportunity, you really do do that because you, you just know it may not come again. So I think we are, we, you know, we are potentially braver. I don't know. That may be unfair for working class Southerners who just feel the same as we feel. Um, and it may be more about class than actually being Northern. But mm. I, I, I do think there is that, quality in northern women that are strivers and that are honest and they want to get things done mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely um we've got um a, a question in the chat um which i don't know if, if um one of you would like to take what is it particularly about the north that makes you all feel this passionately about where you grew up for me it's the humor I mean, and I say this often when I'm talking to new writers who, who, who sometimes are a bit earnest in, in what they're writing. I've, as a northerner, I've never been to a, a wedding where someone didn't end up crying and I've never been to a funeral where someone didn't end up laughing. In fact, I've been to a funeral that turned into a pub quiz. Um, and that that humour, that sense of humour, that let's get on with it. I, um, recently had a we had a loss in the family and the, the line that kept coming to me it was awful and sad was that victoria wood thing where when when a someone dies in a northern family someone goes right with 72 pound cakes to butter you split our butter and it's that constant practicality and humor and finding the lightness in it that i think i think is a big part of it for me Mm, awesome that is such an unforgettable sketch isn't it I, I use that line every time we're doing any kind of kids party or it's just it's just etched in my memory that that scene I'm, I'm so glad that you've referred to that and also to Victoria Wood what an, what a great northern woman um gosh yes Helen did you want to answer this well, I just, I think it's, um, I think it's that sense of authenticity, you know, which kind of, um, you know, aligns with what Tracy was saying about the, about the House of Commons. You know, I, I do feel like I have no nonsense conversations when I go back home <laughs> and, and see the people that I grew up with, you know, or I'm talking to other Northerners. It's just, kind of one of those things isn't it when you I don't know if the rest of the panel feel this but if you if you meet another northerner you just know you're going to have a really great conversation and there's <laughs> going to be none of this sort of skirting around the surface you're going to get to the heart of the matter and you're going to get to it quickly and you're going to have a right old laugh generally I would say I don't I don't want to stereotype here but but you know I think I just think that's I think that's what makes me feel proud, just that, that kind of sense of authenticity and the sense of pride that other people feel, you know, that, that you know, just talking about Hull, you know, that, that people from Hull feel about coming from Hull, you know, there's this real sense of 
we're the end of the line and you're only going to come to Hull if you're coming to Hull. And I love that sort of independent spirit. I think it should be celebrated. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what makes me feel so passionate about coming from there. Oh, gorgeous. I love it. This is this is really, really fantastic and really a kind of edifying, edifying and inspiring to sort of hear all this. Um, re- really wonderful. Um, because I know, Tracy, we haven't got you for much longer. Um, I'm wondering if um, just thinking about this, this question of tenacity, um, I just want to circle back to, to use that terrible American expression, please forgive me, to this um question about um resources at the moment and the lack of resources that we recognize kids have in respect of cultural education and schools and Hannah was talking about instruments I mean it just makes you want to weep that about kids not having instruments for example um you know and obviously you know we have to recognize politically where we are right now and and you know what what where, what the kind of government that we've got the kind of ideology that we've that, that's sort of surrounding so much of what we're living and, and how we're trying to kind of you know navigate things um but I'm curious about how can we stay tenacious and, and what can we do about these sorts of questions and and how can we you know how can we help you in your work and, and what do you think the solutions might be while we're in this kind of strange political climate I think that's quite a quite a wide ranging question, but absolutely pivotal that we know that the COVID pandemic has hit young people incredibly hard. Um, They've not been able to be with their friends. A whole year of their life is massive. The debacle around GCSEs and A-levels about uh, do you go to university? You know, you you go and you're paying and you've you've not met met anybody because you're locked in your room. Um, Also for youngsters, not having met other youngsters because they've been with their parents for a year. So their p- potential growth has been st- st- uh, changed in a way. Um, when I was the Shadow Secretary of State for DCMS and the Shadow Minister for Culture, this was something that really um, focused a lot of my attention. So I was really proud to co-chair the Acting Up report, which was about access to culture for young people. And a lot of it is class over and above um, from the North. But I do think there is a reason why families pay those eye-watering prices for private school. It's because they have a, a film club, they have an orchestra, they have a music studio. They, if you want to learn the harp, you can. Um, they have practice rooms. They have brilliant theatres with technicians. And this this doesn't mean that they're going to be actors or musicians, but what it does is it gives them that enhancement and that enrichment so that they become more emotionally empathetic or emotionally intelligent or um, more confident or better public speakers or to have more wide ranging understanding about culture Um, and music, you know, is very uplifting. So I think the fact that we have lost all of the arts teachers, apart from mu- um, art, sorry, and art is just sort of kept stable in the numbers in schools. Drama teachers have dropped off a cliff. Mm-hmm. Music teachers embedded in schools have dropped off a cliff. And now it's about hubs or potentially being offered six lessons on a ukulele. And if you don't show any interest, that's your music education gone. You, you'll never pick up an instrument again. So it is heartbreaking and um, uh, so frustrating that government don't understand that this is also about well-being, that we all know on this call about flow and about being so absorbed in something, and actually whether that's sport or music, flow helps mental health. And what we've got is um, a burgeoning mental health crisis amongst, amongst our young people. Already when I was an MP, families that do, who, whose children were in crisis who couldn't access CAMS or get support exacerbated by COVID. And as we're slightly opening up now, I think there's also an extra tension about who am I when I'm not at home? Who am I when I'm out with my friends? Who am I when I'm wearing a mask in class? Um, I think there's a lot of um, anxieties and self-harming and all of that. And culture can help us 
build back, as the government I want to talk about, building back better. Um, I have a, a, a mission and uh, one of my manifesto commitments is a creative new deal, which means supporting um, social prescribing in communities. So creatives who potentially can't get back into the sector because they've been locked out for a year. Musicians working with um, those youngsters who uh, feel um, they're struggling or uh, dance classes with dementia sufferers or art classes for those who have got depression. You know, there's lots of ways to use culture, but also I know that um, youth theatres, uh, youth orchestras, choirs, this will help us recover from the pandemic. And that is why it's so heartbreaking to hear the government say they're not gonna support university degrees in the arts and, uh, and backed up with the fact that there's no, there's a, a focus on maths and English. Any extra tuition is gonna be maths and English. I would say it has to be the other way. We have to get children back to some sort of strength, um, mentally and physically and emotionally before they're ready to get back into that academic um, uh, pathway. And that is why Sharon is my best friend because the work that she does um, with young people bringing dance to young people that may not have the opportunity anywhere else but that but her organization being that self-expression and that taking up that space and being heard is so vital for youngsters so my creative new deal will hopefully be um, focused on a lot of those issues about the creative offer in towns and villages and communities, building out the poetry club in your library or your, your community choir. It is about getting us back to full strength and recovering um, after the pandemic, but also saying that we can't allow our, these most amazing jobs to be dominated by just those people whose parents have the money to send them to a good school or a private school. And I think it's, you know, uh, the, the numbers are 76% or something mad. I think um, maybe Lisa can tell me of those who've got BAFTAs went to private school. Mm -hmm. And where is the space for working class voices as writers, as um, creators, as musicians? You've got me on my hobby horse, I'm afraid, Esther. So I've really banged on about that. But it is something that is really profound for me um, and will set the future for our nation if we don't address it as a matter of urgency. Well, I'm really glad to have got you on your hobby horse because that's what tonight's all about, really. It's about, you know, us sort of standing up for what, what's right and what, what we really, really believe in. And um, we're just very lucky that we've got you, Tracy, who has such a sophisticated and nuanced understanding of this subject, um, you know, and how you've just spoken to the mental health aspects of all of this and, you know, the resilience and young people as well, which is um, a subject that's very close to pilot's heart because that's our kind of target audience we bat on about this is our hobby horse as well to be honest um so um so thank you for sort of speaking up and thank you for you know maintaining tenacity in thinking out of the box in terms of uh, and forging forward with this because it's just so important it's so important because it's so unfair the inequality and the, the inequity that surrounds all of this for all the reasons that you outlined um lisa do, do you want to speak to this as well just because i'm aware of the work that you've done and, and tracy's just also highlighted it it's i mean it, the, the intersections on this it, it are quite important as well because the the effect not just on working on working class kids but that includes um, kids from Black and Asian communities, from um, other from minority ethnicity communities, etc. That um, effect is particularly acute, and we've got every major organisation saying they want diversity and equality, and it has to start with the kids at school. It's too late if we're getting them at eighteen. It's too late at twenty-one. And Tracy's absolutely right. There's a reason Eton has a fully 
uh, equipped theatre and a lovely music room and an orchestra and all the rest. And it's not just so the kids can play on the last night of the proms or whatever. It's so that they can be inoculated against that imposter syndrome that affects so many working class kids or kids from minority backgrounds or unheard communities because that feeling of being othered and not quite right uh, and not own in the space that the arts often occupy and you know I'm 20 years into a writing career and I'm still a little bit nervous going into a room with my accent it goes up and down I code switch definitely um and so we we know that the economic argument is already there the, the creative industry bring billions into this country we have a skills gap that has to be filled and we stopped having to ha we need to stop pretending that Benedict Cumberbatch can do everything he can so that's that's me on my hobby half hours there thank you no th thank you and there's lots of um nodding and laughter and um you know um connection with with what you've just said i think um the panelists are um very much um feeling this feeling feeling that passion and, and feeling uh united with you lisa in your rage about the the subject so thank you now the the it's all kicking off um, in the Q&A um, chat box. So I must bring the audience in. Um, I have a question from Kerry. Um, as Northerners, we're often very proud of where we're from, our, our values of authenticity and humour. Do you think the foregrounding of these values and qualities can enable others to dismiss and uh, underestimate us sometimes? Um, so I guess it's kind of a question around um, the, the, flip, the flip side of, of some of what we were talking about earlier. What do, what do we think about that? Or what do we think about the pitfalls of some of that? Um, possible stereotyping? Some nods from the room. Hannah, did you have your hand up? No? <laughs> if, if everybody's a man, I'll, I'll speak to this Only as well. Yeah. And, you know, as I just said, the accent uh, can be softened. It can be made a bit broader. by Tracy. Um, uh, but that underestimation, they do that at their peril. Um, you know, the assumption that because you've got that slightly thicker accent or, or actually just an accent at all, and I'm sure it happens to Welsh and Scottish and um, Geordies and Liverpudlians as well, that idea that if you've got a regional accent, um, you're not as worldly, you're not as understanding. The fact of the matter is I go into that, those meetings absolutely knowing my stuff inside and out. I love television. I know everything about it. Quiz me. I, I wish they'd bring uh, Telly Addicts with Noel Edmonds back because I'd, I'd go on it in a flash. Um, and so that underestimation sometimes plays out well for you, but you've got to get in the room in the first place. And um, I was working with an American producer a couple of years back and he'd done a bit, I, and we were doing very well it was it was a, a, a novel that he wanted adapting um and it was all going great and then he came back to me in a meeting and said i was uh, doing a bit of due, due di diligence i won't do the accent um and talking to some other producers and he mentioned a, produ a bbc producer who i have never ever worked with and the comment was she's very northern now because this produ other producer was um american he didn't know what that meant he was like, so what, what does he mean by that? I said, well, I mean, I can only assume that he means um, I'm a bit unworldly, I'm a bit of a yokel, whatever. And he said, well, that's not my experience. And he said, yeah, because I'm not, because my accent doesn't mean uh, is no indicator of my level of intelligence and skill. So um, it's still out there, definitely. Um, but like I say, you've got to get in the room first. And if people assume because of, you're coming from outside of the M25 that you're not available for meetings, then that is enormously frustrating. Mm. But Lisa, it's so phenomenal and inspirational that you're so uncompromising about your accent and your identity when, when you know, there could be that risk of people, you know, forming a certain sort of perspective about you straight away. This is something that I've talked to my close friends about, actually, um, who don't work in the arts, who work in things like um, one of them's in the civil service. Um, and she's had comments like, Oh, you know, I know you from Chesley Street, which is just north of Durham, and she does have quite a thick accent. And I've, I never really realised how how intelligent you are. You're really, really whip smart, yeah, <laughs> and stuff like that. So I do think it's it goes on. It's um, 
yeah and and I, and I think it's I, I'm really impressed by my friend that she um she won't compromise about her accent in that in that workplace which is full of public school people or people with very well-spoken voices but surely the compromise would be working with someone who has such a low opinion on you based on so little information and that's true of working with someone who's misogynistic or transphobic or racist i mean if we if we're genuine about making that change in the creative industries then we have to stop working with people like that frankly um and so if i've not got in the meeting because they think uh, i'm just an northerner then i probably didn't want to work with them in the first place to be quite honest and that's a i appreciate that's a privileged position to come from uh, not everybody has that um that choice to to them but yeah the less we work with people like that the better yeah and and the less we sort of spot that and we kind of call it out we have a job of allyship don't we when we see those things happening to question ourselves and to, and to question others um, and find ways to sort of just really pause to think about where um, our bias is, um, yeah, is, is, is stopping us from, from really seeing that someone's full, full person, if you like, and full potential. Um, here's a, um, a question from Siobhan, who's in Manchester and, and Belfast, but presumably not at the same time, but I think that might be where she hails from and where she's talking to us from. Um, can any of the panellists talk about the growth of opportunities in radio, TV, theatre and film for women in the north um, and hope for the future. For instance, the recent announcement that the BBC will be moving more production out of London. Helen, I think that's for you. Is that me then? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a great time to be based in the north if you want to work in, in radio or TV. I, like across the board, not just at the BBC, you know, I mean, uh, Tracy was talking to us looking into the the um, offices in the Channel 4 in Leeds, wasn't she? So, um, you know, the, Channel 4 have, have just recently made Leeds a, a big base. Obviously, there's Salford, you know, um, uh, Media City in Salford, which has it's a huge BBC base, but ITV are there as well. That's where Coronation Street is, is now filmed. Um, so yeah, it's it is a brilliant opportunity. This is a this is a big, you know, it's a it's a kind of long-term plan. So uh, you know, it's it's it kind of won't kick in fully until 2027, 2028. But um, Certainly in terms of radio, I mean, we've got, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll talk to pop music because that's the, the area um, that, that I work in. So, um, for instance, the whole of Asian Network is moving to Birmingham, okay, apart from the breakfast show. I know that's not the North, but that's a, <laughs> an indication of, you know, um, Six Music uh, is uh, over 60, which Hannah has done work for um, at, at Six Music, um, over 64%, um, I think, of Six Music over by 27, 28 will be coming from Salford. Uh, and uh, with Radio 1 and Radio 2 by 27, 28, uh, at least one key daytime strand will be coming from somewhere across the UK. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the north, but from somewhere, you know, outside of the M25. So, um, and this will see, and, and the reason the BBC is doing this is, is not, uh, is making sure that we broaden the representation of voices that you hear on the BBC. So Lisa, we want to hear your voice. <laughs> you know, we really do, um, you know, and, and reflect the lives and, and experiences of, of um, people from right across the country. And I'm sure you'll have seen the news, you know, I think it was last week or the week before that Holby City is, is coming to a close. And the BBC are going to do a new long running soap opera based somewhere else in, in the UK to make sure that we're authentically reflecting those voices and experiences. And 
The whole point of this is to drive an explosion in production companies as well, you know, and production talent as well as presenting and production talent right across the UK. So it's a it's a really exciting opportunity. And if you're certainly wanting to work, for, you know, for the BBC in radio, please drop me a note and I can kind of pass you on to the to the appropriate people, um, you know, because. Uh, yeah, we want to. We really want to grow the um, creative sector where where it will help grow the creative sector where we can. Well, that's awesome, Helen, and that's an absolutely awesome offer to anyone um, in the group um, who's looking for sort of support and advice about getting into radio um, where they are. Thank you very much for that. Um, that that's great, and it does feel like it's a really exciting time in Leeds. Um, in respect of the companies that are moving. We've also got the amazing Leeds 2023 and all the energy around that, which just feels something really exciting. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I think one of the qualities I have in, in my northernness is a sense of cynicism about things, but, but also I, I do want to lean towards optimism that, you know, we, we have such a great basis from all the values that we we're talking about earlier. Um, and we're good at doing things together um, that, you know, let's be hopeful, let's be hopeful that and optimistic um, for those amazing projects and companies that are, are moving here and, and investing here. I think that's really, really exciting. Um, Mandy Smith um, from Pilot Theatre has um, a question about tenacity. Can you name an inner personal quality you have had to draw on to be and to remain tenacious. So you might want to just have a little think about a situation where you've really had to dig in. <laughs> I have this face <laughs> and I'm being especially tenacious. And I'm looking at this panel of amazing women knowing that they'll have been there as well on many occasions. Um, so would you like to answer that? Sharon, you're nodding. <laughs> I've got to watch my head. <laughs> wow, um, great question. I really, I, I kind of think back to the situations that has needed me to find courage. I think I've, I've very much had to kind of figure out what strength I have to be able to deal with certain situations and circumstances. And I would say I've had to dig deep to find courage and to know when to put that on the platform and to stand behind it and to make sure that it's broad enough to protect me and it's strong enough to be the voice. But I think that is one of the areas um, that, yeah, I would say to, to Mandy that I would encourage anyone to find the, kind, the courage and, and belief that, you know, the two things are really needed to stand in the same family, in the same household, in the same kind of, they've got to be friends of each other. Um, I would, I would leave that with you, Mandy. Uh, if you can find courage very often, that door that, um, that was talked about earlier, when it's slightly ajar, just find the courage to step onto the other side. Just find the courage to say yes, or sometimes to say no. Mm. Just find the courage to be content with the, the decision that you've made and not have to feel that you go back to that because you haven't done it with sincerity or honesty. The courage to leave things where they are, but to put them out there in the first place, yeah. Superb answer, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any reflections on that, on, on the personal quality that you have to draw on to be and to remain tenacious? Hannah? Yeah, I, um, yeah I've, I've found in the last few years of, of drawing on courage to be a massive thing. And I guess like some of the music that I've been making over the last few years, whether it be with kind of colliery brass bands where you're the only female or you're the youngest female and people kind of don't know what you do and look at you like you just popped out of an egg and don't know anything. Um, but, you know, there's, I guess, you know, I did a, a recording the other week with the, the Ulster Orchestra and that's the first time I've conducted a larger orchestra than kind of a session orchestra, you know, for records and stuff. and. And after a year of lockdown and not knowing um, really anybody in the orchestra and and how to approach it, I guess those the strength of just being able to 
be kind to people and being able to recognize that actually other people around you are nervous as well and are actually wondering um I guess you know to try and separate your head from your gut which is very very hard but sometimes to just think of other people first before you think of yourself because then it takes it out of your own mindset and that's the only way I've found that I can get through stuff because I think then I think my trait is to go if I want something and I want to do this then I I want to be nice because I want people to be nice back and I want to get this and usually that seems to work and in terms of tenaciousness and making sure that there is a nice environment to work in so you can collaborate together and you can achieve the things that you want to achieve um i was doing a a session i work with paul weller quite a lot and i was talking to him about like a lot of the records that we've been making lately in the last few years and he was asking me about the, my career and i just was like well i just i said i have to find like persistence constantly but in a way that is consistent, like with good quality consistency. So not faltering off that path and making sure that, you know, whatever, whoever you've got around you is people that you want to, you want to work with, like what Lisa was saying, like it, um, yeah, I probably waffled on a bit too much then. <laughs> so. No, 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 that's amazing. And I love that idea about trying to separate the mind from the body, you were saying, like the gut, sorry, the head from the gut. Um, I think that's a sort of superpower um, to be able to kind of read a room and understand the people in, in, in the room um, uh, and just sort of take that pause to sort of um, think beyond yourself. I think that's, that's a really skillful thing to have developed and um, all power to you. And it's great <laughs> advice. I think it's great advice because I think there's lots of situations that can be destabilizing um, where you feel like you're being judged or, you know, well, like, we can think of lots of different situations like that. And if you just take that pause, um, you can come back with a different sort of approach and a different martial, different qualities. Um, I think that's, that's really wonderful. And then the sort of notion of um, developing one's um, sort of support in a, in a way, like finding, finding the, the people who in the first place you don't need to um, explain yourself to because you're just all in the same, you know, you get one another and you're all um, working towards the same thing anyway, which is what working with um, the musicians that you work with regularly, it feels like you've got that lovely, um, you know, experience. Um, that's also just really sensible advice. It's it's good to find allies and it's good to find good collaborators. And, you know, there are moments when you may be not working with them where you can lean on them actually for help and support and advice. Um, uh, handra Hilary Carty, um, who runs the Claw Leadership Programme, talks about handrails, finding your handrails. Um, which is just a great um, image um, that I'll never forget now, actually, um, that also your comment makes me think of. Helen, what about, what about you? Well, uh, I, I mean, I think um, there's a few things running through my head, actually, when, when um, Sharon and, and Hannah were talking. Um, I when i've been my most tenacious so so how to be tenacious <laughs> um i like for me and this goes back to something lisa said which was about preparation right to fair to fair, a little saying that sticks in my head is to fail to prepare is to prepare to fail okay so every situation every radio studio i've ever walked into I am prepped to the nth degree, right? For all of it. And I know exactly where the radio show is going, but I have the confidence, you know, the belief in, in, in what I'm doing to think that if we go off down a different path, that's fine because I've got the roadmap here. So I can go off down this little journey and round this nook and cranny and, you know, whatever. But you need to have done the groundwork. Don't busk it. Don't, don't be one of these people that just busks things. Do the work, do the work, you know, because then you are talking from a position of authority, you know? I truly, truly believe that. And then to what Sharon was saying um, just before about, uh, you know, saying yes to things, 
And I was actually thinking the opposite. And then you did say, Sharon, you know, feeling okay to say no. And I was really thinking about, for me, the power of saying no. You know, the power of no. Um, I'm the queen of always saying yes to stuff because I like to be busy and I like to be stimulated and I like to be creative and I like to be excited. And, and there, are, there are probably about three or four occasions in my career when I've been asked to do things, you know, big, lead big projects or something like that. And, and when I have said no, it has felt so much more powerful because I don't normally say no, you know, I'm normally a person that goes, yeah, why not? You know, and then I'm up till three in the morning kind of doing my prep, you know, but actually when you say no and you know why you're saying no, and it, again, to Hannah's point, actually, about feeling it in your gut, you know, you know, in your gut, your gut never lies. Um, that's that's I think that 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 sums up being tenacious for me, actually. Yeah. Knowing your mind, knowing your gut, knowing your mind, feeling confident in your response, feeling confident to say no. And, you know, that people will take it or leave it. But, you know, you've made the right decision for you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, this next question is a great question and an important question. Um, which I'd love to hear your, your thinking on. Um, do you have imposter syndrome or have you had it in the past linked to being Northern? And if so, how do you challenge this or how did you challenge this? I think I've, I've already said that, yes, mm. I have. And I want to speak. I, I will speak in praise of imposter syndrome because the opposite of imposter syndrome is thinking you are utterly entitled to your position in the world, irrespective of your skill set, ability, intelligence. That makes you a sociopath or Matt Hancock. So you know, <laughs> yes, I have, and it has been very much linked to being northern. But do you know what? I think the thing about imposter syndrome is that whatever it is that you feel nervous about yourself, that's what you're linking to. So, so for me, it was, it's being Northern and sometimes it's about being fat as well. And if it wasn't, it would be something else. And I think uh, it's really healthy in, in these kind of spaces to admit that, yes, I mean, you know, in the before times, before we were all uh, stuck in the house making sourdough, um, it's only two years since I, I got invited to a very, very lovely Channel 4 party and I didn't stay along because I really didn't uh, feel part of it and that wasn't the fault of Channel 4, they were all very lovely, but um, Stanley Johnson walked into the room and I was like, no, no, that's me out of here, I'm de this is definitely not for the likes of me, that and the cast of uh, The Only Way is Chelsea or whatever they call them, um, I, was, I went back to my hotel room uh, and watched a movie with um, a, a pret a manger sandwich because I'd had enough. So I, I would speak in praise of it, um, but whatever it is, just I just think knowing that everybody's got that little voice in their head, unless there's something very seriously wrong with them. So feel the fear and do it anyway. I think that I think that's definitely what Sharon was saying. Mm, that's lovely. Feel the fear and do it anyway. And I agree. I, I don't think imposter syndrome is something that ever goes goes away is it it's just something that you sort of learn to live with and like you say it has the two there's the two sides to the coin and actually it can be a really really positive thing um self-doubt um is sort of really linked to innovation so you know if we if we didn't have that kind of doubting side of ourselves it, it's very often in create in creative thinkers actually and that's how they innovate and how they are so super creative so that's like the positive to the to the negative would anybody else like to speak to this about specifically imposter syndrome linked to being northern or having a northern accent or um, feeling, you know, feeling that you're at the wrong party? Sharon? I'll, I'll just pick up on something and someone you mentioned earlier. So the, the core leadership. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm also a fellow and I, um, I remember thinking that actually if the claw couldn't do this for me there's nobody else that could do this I needed that moment of transition coming from a practical based artist and um, being on stage and then suddenly realizing that actually I've got a team to manage and I've got to look at finance and I've got to do all of these things so 
off I went and managed to get the cloth. But I was in a room with people that perhaps were, were not quite like me. Um, and those moments where you begin to feel that imposter syndrome moments and you're, you're kind of, you know, it sort of takes me back to actually the moments where I'm preparing for stage, where you get those kind of butterflies and some of them don't feel so good and you're about to go in and you can, can I make it happen? Actually, you haven't got a choice. You just got to keep going. And boom, you're out there and it feels absolutely amazing. So there's a, there's a moment where you have to acknowledge that it's happening as a real thing. And then you kind of measure how much of you, how much of the iceberg is out of the water? How much of the, the kind of the, the buoyancy do you have to make sure that you go in the right direction with the way that you're feeling? And I, I guess when I think about coming from Leeds, coming from a local city and kind of knowing that actually I'm much better than what people assume I am. And I know I can do better, I can offer better and I want better, then I'm gonna go and make it happen. And I guess the first time I arrived in those rooms where I know that people were already CEOs from all over the world, they were kind of really big hitters already. And I'm thinking, I'm prejudiced. What on earth are you doing here when I'm from the North? I'm that kind of, you're taking up space that you shouldn't be tapping. So, you know, you're kind of already making judgment about your position in that room. And, you know, there were times when you just go, okay, you need to put up or shut up. And that's when you kind of, you know, you start to shift the balance of where that kind of, inferiority complex comes into it, inferior, the kind of the, the complexities around self. And actually what's really nice is that you do bring a different perspective to that room where you're educating people who you've already assumed have got all of this wonderful thing going on. And you suddenly now begin to see yourself in the right space with the right people, but actually championing your vision and your, and your mission in those environments. So it's, it has, it's got its usefulness as the kind of imposter syndrome, it really has, it just keeps you buoyant. And I think as like, we, I don't think it'll ever go away um, in whatever role we, we play, whatever role we take on. I would say I embrace it as a friend that I didn't invite in, but I've got to live with you. That's fantastic. A friend that um, I didn't invite in, but that I have to live with. I think that's really, really great phrase and a really great way to put it. Um, we're actually sort of coming towards the end of our session. Um, there's a final question in the chat, um, though, that I'd like to share with you all um, to see what advice you have. Um, so the question is, what advice would the, pan would the panel give to a young Northern woman about to train in the arts at these times of cuts, lower performance opportunities, post-pandemic? How would you encourage her tenacity? What a brilliant question. I, if, I, if nobody minds me saying, I would say you're absolutely right. It is tough, tough off at the moment out there. But what you do have in your um, scope is um, access to technology that was unthinkable for me when I was starting out, platforms that were not available to so social media, TikTok, things like that. Um, get yourself out there. Don't feel you have to make everything a masterpiece. That just getting your name out there, show that you're willing, show that you want to make work, show your creativity. It's hard not knowing what discipline you're into. So I'll speak to writing. You know, get your pen out, get writing. Don't spend time bemoaning this situation. It's awful. The Tories are terrible and they're just awful human beings and the arts are being overlooked. That's a given. Let's put a pin in it and get some work out there, uh, whether it's on the theatre, whether it's stand up comedy, whether it's dancing in City Square, do something and, and invite people like the people on this panel to see it, to watch it, to participate in it. Because the great thing about the arts is we're all rooting for you at the moment. And so if we can, we'll give you that support. Lovely, beautiful answer, and I totally concur with that. Fantastic. It makes me think about a good mate of mine um, is the playwright, Amanda Whittington, and we were both working in Nottingham in our sort of 20s and early 30s and finding the patriarchy really, really difficult. And we came up with this phrase, it was Amanda who came up with the phrase, which is, um, you know, the best form of resistance is persistence. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and I still remember that now and it's actually really true and I think that's why you know god a, a very long time later one is still trucking one is still trucking away I think there's so much to be said for just doing it anyway just doing it anyway um and just going for it um 
any other thoughts from from other panel members on this helen well i i was just thinking of whenever you know sort of uh people from student radio come to talk to me or you know at, at various kind of radio industry events or at the radio festival or, or something like that and they and they're looking for advice and 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 asking how how they should you know what do I do? How how do I how do I get into this amazing industry? Because radio is amazing. Honestly, I love it. Um, and uh, and I say to them, it, 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 you know, I say to them, you need to decide what you want to do, and then just go for it. So it's really the same advice as Lisa. Really, I say the the, the phrase I use the most when talking to uh, young people is. Decide what you want to do, go for it, and go for it with gusto, you know? Do not get distracted and knocked off course. You just go for it. Have confidence in yourself, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, I would say go for it and go for it with gusto. Esther, can I add to that? Mm. I, um, I have 250 young people that I'm going to be speaking to shortly and wishing them well on their graduation. Entering a world that we no longer recognize in a situation where we're challenged financially and we're encouraging others to come through the door to pick up a career in the performing arts. Now, that to, to the kind of measure of that is really quite challenging. But the reality is, if we don't have you, we have no golden thread that fixes us. We've just experienced a whole year of a lockdown and across the whole of the country and actually across the globe, We've seen where arts and culture has been the thing that's actually kept us going, mm. that's kept our sanity, that's kept us connected. And I, without that, I mean, it's one thing I would love to say, say to our government, you imagine your life without culture. Just take one moment to strip your life of culture and see what happens to you. It keeps us human and we need you. We absolutely need you in our world. And that's the thinking outside of the box. Money can be a real challenge. There's a reality around that. But yeah. actually, you need to come and talk to us because there's, there's ways in which you know, we can figure out how you can still engage with the art form that you love or that you want to engage with to make it happen. And that gusto that, we're, that you've just heard about, that's what's gonna help you get closer to your, to your goals. That's what's gonna help you to kind of find yourself in the room. The courage that we've talked about, put that somewhere and just say, I'm standing on that courage and I'm gonna take an opportunity to be and do the things that I wanna do. But don't get put off by the fact that actually we are challenged right now and the government doesn't see our values. Um, give it a go, step through the door, have the conversations. You've got a great panel here. Fire, fire the questions, let, let us help you open the door. That's the, the generosity that we have of artists. As artists, as people that have experienced the challenges ourselves, we know it's important. Each one teach one is a saying. So let's kind of make that happen. That's lovely. And I love that phrase, each one teach one. That's just such a, that's such a beautiful, conception and um great to hear um such such optimism um and, and such a spirit of tenacity again um in um in in thinking of this future and just reminding ourselves of our value you know and, and what we what we really do you're so right Sharon um you yeah you're so right and as we've already said within this conversation um the likes of those who are currently in government know this because they've been to all of those schools and they've had all of those opportunities and that's what why they're so good at public speaking and all the rest of it um hannah i wonder if you can speak to this um as an artist um and i'm sort of curious in um the sort of amazing um sort of um array of things that you do and whether there's anything in um having a sort of flexibility around your your conception of yourself when you graduate from somewhere like Lipper or somewhere like um, the Northern School of Contemporary Dance? Do the, are those sorts of things helpful? I'm just wondering whether you could take us through your experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I guess my experience actually at university was quite a, a strange one because the uni at the time was going at Lippa was going through a kind of change of the music degree from a performing arts, which is where you collaborated with dance and 
and and actors and management and and then moved into a, a full music degree and I was kind of at the end of that when that happened and what and you know things like happened like where I wouldn't have certain lessons teachers didn't turn up because they didn't know where they were and and the thing that got me through that and has stayed with me throughout my whole career is it was my peers um all my work comes from people that I studied with people that I I mean not all of it now but you know in the beginning it was always about touring and and recording in studios and writing music and it all came from people that I worked with at uni and those are the people that got me through those stages of when you let out into the open and you go oh my god what do I do um I just wanted to go back to like um what Helen was saying about the the prep and what what somebody taught me was a, a phrase called the seven p's and it stayed and it's it's always makes me laugh because it's so true and it and it the seven p's are proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance <laughs> <laughs> and and it's so true like everything I've done like you have to prepare before you go in and um even to the point of like knowing who you are with and knowing what they are doing and what their job is and I, I think um yeah that, that that stayed with me so awesome awesome well um we're gonna have one final poll now I want to just um, read the room and find out how um, tenacious everybody who's been listening to this is now feeling after this um, great event, really inspirational event. It's been really special to be part of this tonight. I feel really privileged to have been able to host this and hear this fantastic um, advice and thoughts and reflections. It makes me feel so proud to be a northern woman and a northern woman in the arts so um thanks to our amazing panel for everything that they've contributed really um now look at this um this is looking pretty good guys we've now got a very tenacious room <laughs> we've got most people saying that they now feel very tenacious and they're going to go out after this session they're going to make their dreams happen. They're going to change the world. They're going to support all of us in our work as we sort of forge forward, trying to gather up, make as many opportunities for young people and those who are underrepresented in our sectors. Um, so that's just a magnificent um, end poll there with almost 80% on very tenacious and only 3% feeling a bit tenacious, but nobody is not feeling tenacious at all, which is just great so fabulous so just to wrap this up i have to say a big thank you to arts council england and to the york festival of ideas thank you very much um, for your support of this event this event is part of our northern girls project um, which is about the empowerment of women in the north um, where we commission playwrights and we work with communities and we platform the voices of women which is really exciting in the autumn this year, we're going to be working in Bridlington, in York, and in Redcurt, which is a town that I grew up in um, on the North Yorkshire coast, to make that project happen.